US jobs growth was much stronger than expected over the weekend, but the bond market sell-off was eventually tepid as it became clear wage growth and unemployment wasn't quite so inflationary. That's coming up in our five things in five minutes. And then in our bonus deep dive interview, we go inside the RBA's half-yearly financial stability review with Adelaide Timbrell. From reading through the financial stability report, it doesn't seem like the Reserve Bank expects widespread financial stability issues. And this is a really strong supporting point for the higher for longer interest rates. If the Reserve Bank was worried about the financial stability of the average Australian business or household, that might be an argument for them to actually ease interest rates early, even when inflation is high. But first in 5 and 5 with ANZ, number one, U.S. non-farm payrolls grew 336,000 in September from August, which was almost double what the markets were expecting. There were also revisions upwards in previous month's figures. Here's ANZ Group's chief economist, Richard Yitzinger. Payrolls were strong. I don't think there's any way to, to really discount it away. The employment number was strong. Wages was broadly in line, unemployment broadly in line. But I think the strength of employment keeps that hawkish Fed tilt alive, keeps that discussion about whether the Fed will go or won't go one more time in this interest rate um, tightening cycle and very much puts the spotlight on the week ahead when we have the next US CPI number. Number two, I asked Richard what this would mean for the Fed's next decision at the beginning of November. As of the weekend, market expectations had firmed slightly to a one-third chance of a rate hike, with the probability of a December hike now just over half. Do you think it's strong enough to push the Fed over the edge or is the jury still out? I don't think it's strong enough on its own to push the Fed over the edge, no. Uh, Strong demand is a good thing rather than a bad thing. It only becomes, in a way, a bad thing um, once it starts to cause an inflation problem and cause the Fed challenges with achieving its inflation objective. Wages was not too strong. The unemployment rate didn't fall. So I think the Fed will take it as a leaning in that hawkish direction, but let's hope the CPI is um, is pretty in line this week. Number three, bond markets initially sold off again after the numbers, but perhaps not as aggressively as they might have if the wage inflation and unemployment data had also been as strong as the jobs growth. The US 10-year actually only closed up one basis point at 4.79% having spiked to a fresh 16-year high of 4.89% soon after the figures. US stocks actually closed up. The S&P 500 closed up 1.2%, and the NASDAQ was ahead by 1.6%. US dollar also initially strengthened, but it edged back through Friday night. The Aussie dollar initially fell to 63.26 cents, but opens this morning at 63.85. The Kiwi also fell initially to 59.34 US cents, but is opening this morning at just under 60 US cents, 59.90. Number four, I asked Richard if the Fed could perhaps let the bond market's higher interest rates, which remember are flowing through into higher mortgage rates and bond yields for businesses, actually do the heavy lifting. I've never seen a tightening cycle end without materially higher bond yields and, and and or without materially weaker asset prices. We're getting the bond yields at, a, in a way, a strange time in the cycle, but it's part of the tightening mechanism and we're getting the weaker asset prices again, perhaps at a strange time in the cycle, but it's all part of the, the tightening mechanism. If these things were not happening, um, some people may interpret that as a good outcome, the economist in me would get more worried that there would be even more Fed tightening to come. Number five, the main thing to watch on global markets this week will be the US CPI inflation figure due on Thursday night. ANZ's head of G3 Economics, Brian Martin, tells us in a note, the median expectation is for a 0.3% rise in both the headline and core inflation for the month. That would allow annual inflation to ease further, to 3.6% for the year and 4.1% for the core number. And now for our bonus deep dive interview, we talk to ANZ senior economist in Australia, Adelaide Timbrell, about the RBA's financial stability review on Friday. It looked closely at how households are coping with tighter monetary policy and at the risks 
China's property downturn might flow through to Australia. There were no alarm bells in the Reserve Bank's financial stability review uh, when it came to, you know, households or businesses. And this is very similar to what we saw in their post-meeting statement after their October decision. They're saying the vast majority of Australian borrowers have continued to service their debts. They're saying the business sector remains resilient. And interestingly, few signs of financial stress, even among owners of Australian commercial real estate, which has, due to low valuations and high interest rates, had a particularly hard time in the post-COVID transition from into more work from home. So overall, not many warning signs. They have highlighted some pockets of stress, including you know, lower income families where they might be renting because rentals are going up very quickly. And then for mortgage payers, the average variable mortgage has gone up 30 to 50%. So while most households are still able to pay, that certainly doesn't mean that they're not being forced to cut back on other things. We see that in the Australian Bureau of Statistics data as well, with discretionary consumption coming down for six months in a row, despite population growth being extremely rapid during that time. So the Reserve Bank is saying that even though there is some more discomfort and stress, um, it's not to a point where it would create some sort of um, financial issues or instability in the financial system. From reading through the financial stability report, it doesn't seem like the Reserve Bank expects widespread financial stability issues. And this is a really strong supporting point for the higher for longer interest rates. If the Reserve Bank was worried about the financial stability of the average Australian business or household, that might be an argument for them to actually ease interest rates early, even when inflation is high. But the, you know, commentary from this report is really not saying that. It's saying, yes, there are a few people in really dire situations, but for most people, interest rates are still low enough that they can actually muddle through this painful transition period. Now, one other area that the Reserve Bank has highlighted is the stress in the Chinese property market. Could you give us a sense of how the Reserve Bank sees that? Yes, local government debt in China is very high. There are falling house prices and uncertainty regarding the completion of homes under construction uh, in China. Now, the way that this impacts Australia is through, you know, commodity exports as well as our currency. So, when the Reserve Bank is highlighting vulnerabilities in China, what they're really looking at closely is how that's going to impact the Australian dollar, how it's going to impact global growth. And because Australia is a smaller open economy, that global growth then feeds into our own growth. And how much of a concern do do they have that it could um, spill over into some sort of wider problem? Because it seems to have stabilised a little bit perhaps in the last uh, few months. Yeah, the Reserve Bank doesn't seem too concerned about a really huge issue um, being transmitted from China to Australia. Uh, They did note that direct links between mainland China's financial system and advanced economy banking systems are limited. Um, And also the direct links between Australia's financial system and China's financial system are small. So it's much more about the indirect effects of a slowdown in China or vulnerability in China, like global economic activity, lower global commodity prices, and um, reduce imports um, from China, whether that's of, you know, iron ore, whether that's of lobster, whether that's of education, all of these things um, are going to reduce some of the bottom lines for Australian businesses. ANZ's Adelaide Timbrell there. I'm Bernard Hickey. That was 5 and 5 with ANZ for Monday, October the 9th. Catch you tomorrow with a look ahead at what's at stake for the economy in New Zealand's election this weekend. This podcast contains general information only, not investment advice. You should obtain advice for your personal circumstances before making any investment decisions. Please view the podcast disclaimer available via your media player or email.